Welcome back, everyone. Next up, we have Encore Resources Corporation. It trades on the OTCQB under the symbol ANKOF and on the TSXV under the symbol ANK and maximizes opportunities across the resource sector. Having been active in the market for over 12 years, they have actively participated in the technological advancements in mineral and energy towards cleaner, more sustainable solutions. Solutions. In the energy areas, they take on carbon reduction and cleaner transitions for energy solutions. And on the mineral side, projects like the environmental sand cleanup illustrate the advancing mineral development while creating benefits across social and environmental platforms. Today, we'll be speaking with Delane Weeks, the CEO of Angor Resources. Delane has been with the company since 2011, first as VP of Social Development, then moving into finance, and now as the CEO for the past two years. It's my pleasure to welcome Delane Weeks for our Emerging Growth Conference. Welcome. Thank you so much, Anna, and we appreciate the opportunity to speak um, about the opportunities with, with Anchor Resources and what is upcoming shortly. So as you described, we are an, a resource optimizer. I want to always encourage any potential investors to review public filings. Ours are available on CDAR and, and uh, you can check us out online. So a resource optimizer, we work both in Cambodia and Canada. And some of the some of the points that are set us apart and is that ultimately we look for these niche opportunities that are going to bring us into production quickly and or create a cash flow for the company. We have management that walks the talk. We've put significant funds into it and 170 million shares, we would hold 28% of those um, with hard cash put in. And ultimately, if we include friends and family, we're up to 40%. We were established in Cambodia as a leader in the oil and gas and the energy sector based on our expertise globally. Um, and we put in pretty creative financing options with special purpose vehicles, or other options so that we minimize dilution. Anchor also established um, the first and the only precedent setting agreement with indigenous people in Cambodia. We're very, very proud of that. We work right through the economic opportunities, education, healthcare, um, and make sure that we're meeting the needs of the locals with that. We also work with teams that are already in place, so we don't wanna be redundant and we want to make sure that were as efficient as possible. So we were formed as a private company in 2009. We were private for two years and then went public in October of 2011. We have been active in Cambodia for 13 years. So we're well versed on the various practices there and the governance in the country, right from the local village level, right up to the high government levels. We have also been uh, recognized at the United Nations for our sustainability and our community development. It's as much about how we do business, not that we do business, um, that has set us apart from others, I believe. We really have strong relationships with the various stakeholders from government, community, civil society, and other industry players. We set national standards in CSR, Right from the right from day one, and like I said earlier, we have a really high level of participation from our management team. So, what do we look like? The slide before you shows the parent company Anchor Resources in Canada, and it has two subsidiaries. One is focused on minerals, that is Anchor Gold Cambodia, which holds three licenses in the country. Both or all three of those are getting very close to drill ready. And we have gold and copper, a couple of copper porphyries on two of the properties and the others have gold prospects, multiple gold prospects on them. The energy subsidiary, Enercam Exploration Canada is a private company held 100% by the parent. It in turn 
owns Enercam Resources Singapore, which owns Enercam Resources Cambodia. Why did we do that? We did that for maximum flexibility so that if the energy plays take off, we can spin off any portion of that. All licenses in Cambodia must be held by a Cambodian entity, which is why we have Enercam Resources Cambodia holding the energy licenses and, and Anchor Gold Cambodia holding the mineral licenses. Some really quick facts. We burn through about 80,000 Canadian each month. We have 170 million outstanding shares, 13 million options issued. We have 35 million warrants that will expire later this week. And our market cap is roughly 15 million Canadian. We have a couple hundred thousand dollars in the bank. But why are we in Cambodia is a common question. Ultimately, one of, the, one of the most attractive elements is that there's no foreign ownership restrictions. So we can hold 100% of our projects. We don't have to have any other body. And the same carries through with a free carry. There's no free carry requirement on, on any of the extractives. The geopolitical risk is low. Like I said, we've been in the country for 13 years. It's very predictable, it's stable, it's safe. We And we've worked in multiple developing countries across the globe. The government is very focused on building growth for the country. They've had a healthy GDP and they put significant infrastructure in place. Um, lots of paved roads give us access, whereas years ago it was far more difficult. The power grid has been updated. And so they're looking to move the country forward. Ultimately, Cambodia, with its history, has been underexplored and highly prospective. It is surrounded by both mineral and oil and gas development on all sides. And they have a pretty, pretty healthy uh, governance in place. They've looked at other nations and brought in the best practices for that, for both their mining laws, their oil and gas laws, and their profit tax is 30% um, annually, but um, there are incentives in place for industries. So like I said, this slide shows that there are surrounding um, mineral developments and, and mining in the area. If you compare the size of Cambodia, it would be like uh, the size of North Dakota for the US and about a fifth of the size of British Columbia for Canadians. So it's a small nation, 15 million people, um, but when, it's, when you take a, a nation that size and it is surrounded by both mining activity and oil and gas activity, including onshore and offshore, then it, it ultimately means that most likely a country that size is going to continue with, those, with the um, mineralization and the resources for oil and gas. So the mineral assets that we currently have, up in the northeast corner near Vietnam, we have the Andong Mia license and the Oyadeo North license. Both of these have gold prospects and Andong Mia also adds a copper porphyry to it. So on the left-hand side of the country, we have Andong Bor, which is a um, already drilled prospect that is a copper porphyry with some gold in it. All of these were worked on this year by our teams, and we're looking to advance the lower part of Oyadeo North and the wild boar prospect on Andong Mia with a partner to prove it out for a gold mine operation. Our mineral targets ultimately, lots of copper, lots of gold. Those are the two main areas that we're focused on. We always keep our eyes open for rare earths and um, uh, PGM groups, green metals. On the energy side, Cambodia had an, has never had an onshore oil and gas well drilled. We looked at all of the licenses available across the country and ultimately after significant research in several years, Block 8 presented what looks like a sedimentary basin a foreland sedimentary basin, they typically have between 50 and 400 million barrels. They're very large reserves. We are targeting 
that there is some existing seismic on it. And ultimately that agreement is signed. We are ready to go. We can move forward. We are ultimately looking for funding on that to advance it. And, and the Block A offshore was a request from the government to assist them in restarting an offshore block. So this was Cambodia's first production. It was held by Chris Energy, who unfortunately went bankrupt in 2021. So then it became a government owned asset. It's a small six well drilling platform that's already in place. It produced roughly 300,000 barrels and we would be targeting between two and three million barrels from that platform. So when we talk about the extractives, the value increments that change a company, that change the value of your shares and bump it up are really in three areas. The first is proving the resource. Second is when you take it to production. And the third involves related industries. We are focused entirely on proving the resource, advanced exploration, drilling it out, and then having independent technical reports that define that resource. So ultimately we were looking on the two gold prospects and the onshore oil. For example, the onshore oil, if we prove 50 million barrels and oil is $75 a barrel, and that value jumps to 3.7 billion. It's very significant when we're proving resources on, on the impact on your, on your value. With the wild boar prospect, gold, if we took a modest 75,000 ounces of gold indicated in as a resource at $2,000 an ounce, it's $150 million. The same would apply to the Pum Sarung North project. We prove 100, and we, we look at that one because it is 300 meters north of an existing mine. The veins are open to the north, open to the south, open at depth. But ultimately, when we look at the value increments, even if we took 10%, because once you prove them, they're still in the ground, you took 10% of those values, we contemplate our $15 million market cap, we take 10% of the oil, it bumps it to 375 million. If you took 10% of a proven mine on wild boar, it's 15 million. And if you took 10% of the Pum Sarung North, it too is 15 million. So you can see for yourself the, the difference in the value. And these, of course, are US numbers versus our current market cap of 15 million Canadian. So ultimately, that's where we're headed this year. Um, and uh, looking forward to, to moving those that value of the company very quickly. So with all the pressure on fossil fuels, one might say, why are we involved with hydrocarbons? Well, the reality is 84% of the world's energy comes from hydrocarbons. So we are, we are in a transition mode for the next several decades to move towards more renewables. In the meantime, the demand in Asia is very, very strong because as nations develop and the population grows at a much faster rate than it does in North America, there are significant demands on. So currently Cambodia spends 3.8 billion annually bringing in oil and gas products. And they are literally standing on their own resource. So they are highly motivated. We are working in the country. Ultimately, we have expertise in this. That's why we're into hydrocarbons. And block eight, which you see in front of you, each one of these black dots indicates an oil seep. That means that the crude is coming out of the ground at some level and has been, we've, been te we've tested it for that. It also, um, it has a mountain range, so it indicates that this foreland sedimentary basin is very typical of other formations. It's close to port, 
close, great highways, good infrastructure, and it has really good source rock and geology that we've tested. So that was our first choice. We're happy to, to move forward with that. So if you're contemplating an investment, you have to ask yourself, why would Anchor be an attractive consideration for you? Ultimately, like I said, we've put our money where our mouth is. It's well backed. We have a strong vested interest. And, and when you see management putting in their own funds, um, it gives you, it mitigates your risk as an investor in moving forward with it. It's a really low price. At six cents American, nine cents Canadian, I think today it's, it, it's got lots of upside to it. And like I said, we're in discussions with a couple different entities currently on moving those two gold plays to a feasibility study for mines and on the onshore oil and gas. We've also, um, with the government, they've, as they've recognized us, it gives us, it puts us in a great position to be, to be instrumental in developing a national energy strategy. So they go away from importing all of their oil and gas and have their own domestic production. It changes the nation. Ultimately, it changes the company too, but it's, it's a major, milestone that we're involved with. Ultimately, the other thing is we've achieved recurring revenue starting this month, the end of this month, on a carbon capture gas conservation project in Canada. Um, and so I think we're on the verge of three major value drivers. Ultimately, Anchor is undervalued at this point. So this carbon capture project in Evesham, Saskatchewan, we pull, you can see in the, in the slide, there's some subtle venting going on of gases. So the production from the oil comes out, is, is settled in the tanks, but the gas has to be released. So it's either flared or it's vented or it's collected and piped, which is what we have done with a series of 20 some of these wells and brought it into a compressor station where we dehydrate it, process it, and convert it to, to clean natural gas. It is then fed into the Canadian energy regulated system, it goes out for energy to heat your homes and, and whatnot. The end result, we have a much cleaner fuel, we have an environmental solution because we've reduced the emissions, and we have cash flow. So currently it's running at about 500,000 cubic feet per day, which isn't a big, it's not a huge operation, but ultimately it pulls all of that from emissions and puts it into a, a proper usage. The other thing I mentioned earlier was our, our agreement with the Indigenous people. And I, I wish we had this in place with our First Nations across Canada. Ultimately, what we've achieved here is, is we work with them on what they need for education, what they're looking for for economic development, what they're looking for for water, sanitation, and, and land rights. And ultimately, they participate in every level of our project for employment. So right from prospecting, exploration, development, production, reclamation, they are directly involved with our, our team and as colleagues in developing the project. We set very, very strong um, right back in 2009 when we started in CSR. And we just think it's, it's just part of doing business. You know, we have a training center that brings students in four times a day from different classes in different areas. And we train them in English and, and, and computer applications, mapping, and a variety of other courses, all of which they request. We have not imposed anything, and that fills up those classes very quickly. Uh, there's ongoing water solutions and health solutions throughout the areas. But ultimately, economic development is 
is needed in every single jurisdiction. And if we sit at the coffee table having uh, a drink with friends, it ultimately boils down to what's what are the best opportunities for jobs, careers, our children, and it's no different there. So Anchor has implemented skill um, skill set improvement right across the board, and to trying to address this and make sure that we're preparing their citizens for advancement. Building relationships at all levels, it makes it's just again it's really good sense. If you're going to do business in any country, you better have strong relationships with all levels of government and all levels of community. So right from the village leaders, Minister of Mines, right up to the Prime Minister. So who are we and what's our management team? Well, I've been involved with um, consultation and economic development in business and finance for um, several decades. I worked in several countries um, across the board. Mike Weeks is our executive VP of operations, vast amount of uh, knowledge in the extractive sector and especially in the oil and gas production areas, both um, uh, in Canada and in several other countries. So he's our leader as a, as a power engineer and puts together the teams that will, will take on exploration, development and production at each stage. Dennis Hulette is our professional geologist and our VP of exploration on the mineral side. One of the greatest things is ben Dennis lives on site up in the province. Justin Snelling is also a professional geologist and he's instrumental in helping us with reservoir analysis. And Benita Sauer is our chief, our, our chief financial officer. She's a partner with MNP. So I want to do some really brief napkin math here. Because the question, if you're even listening, is to say, well, how am I going to get a return here? We've put the ESG in place so that certainly we want to, not only do we want to make you money, but we want you to be proud of how you make your money. So the social side and the environmental side is really important as we cover it. But financially, if we take a look at a, a, a company like this, Anchor is $0.09 cents or $0.06 cents U.S., if we prove either of those gold prospects, we don't have to produce it, we just have to prove it, that bumps the value over double. Then if we add the Saskatchewan gas capture, which we haven't done yet, and, and we add that at 500,000 cubic feet per day, over a, we've given it a 10 year life. And we add the onshore oil and gas, in Cambodia, that's going to take 30 million, but it's going to give significant multiples when we prove that resource. Then we add the opportunity offshore. When that is complete, there's a couple million barrels that will be produced there. And then there's all ultimately several other gold and copper prospects. So what are our goals here? Our goals are to prove the resource on multiple projects, any one of which bumps the value, which presumably would move the stock price. And at the same time, we position Anchor so that it has additional cash flow coming to it and, and to the point where it can support itself on an ongoing basis and ultimately not be vulnerable to the market, any market fluctuations. So that's the quick snapshot of Anchor. That gives you an idea of where we're going in the next few months and how we're going to get there and ultimately what we think will be in place to bring value to our shareholders. So I'm really happy to take, take any questions and back over to you, Anna. Great job, Delane. Okay, yes. Um, so regarding the onshore oil and gas, what amount of funding is necessary for this project to prove a resource and how long will it take? On the onshore oil and gas, we're going to, we're going to need, it'll be a, a dual phase project. It'll be $30 million US to prove uh, that resource of, of 50 million or hopefully larger. How long will it take? I would expect that we would, we'll spend the first 18 months on seismic and, and um, 
and analysis and geophysics. Uh, ultimately, then we will we may be determining some stratigraphic wells, which are shallower wells, um, and those would be taking place with additional drilling from 18 to 36 months. Thank you for that. Uh, so we we so often hear that dealing in countries across Asia involves some corruption, some side deals with authorities. So do you find this to be accurate? And how does Angkor deal with this perception? Anna, that's a really good question. And it's one that no investor should, be, should hesitate to ask because I think every country has some level or some some grade of form of nepotism or corruption or, and, and Asia and Cam Cambodia is no different. What we did like right from the beginning is we said, look, we are a publicly traded company. We are Canadian. This is how we do business. And it does not involve a suitcase full of money coming in to try to make something happen. So because we came right out up front, right from the beginning with that, we're under very little pressure. We don't hear it. We don't have people coming to us saying, well, you know, you got to pay them off. So corruption, I think it's all about how you handle it. It's all about, again, how do you do business, not doing business. And we've simply chosen and said, we can't participate there. We're not going to go down that road. And and so it, it's, been, it's been quite an easy undertaking and uh, hasn't been problematic for us. Great answer. Uh, so what are the timelines on the potential gold development partnerships on the Wild Boar Prospect and the PS North Prospect? So I can say we're in discussions at this point. I would think that we're looking at months, not we're not we're not stretching this out into into years. Um, because I think the price of gold is healthy enough and and ultimately, these are prospects that can quite quickly be moved to a, a feasibility on, on a gold mine. I would guess over the next two to four months, we'll have those in place. Okay, perfect. Now, uh, with all you're exploring, uh, Cam wants to know if you can give us a timeline to somewhat accurately identifying the reserves. Um. Okay, so so they're they're different. I mean, the timelines on a gold, again, you you drill them out, you cut your core, you send it in for assays, come back, um, and then with that, you have an independent analysis. Those independent analyses generally take a couple of months. The drilling, depending on how many holes you're drilling and how deep you're going, um, you know, we'll do. We can do several things. I mean, if it's if it's a if it's really well funded and they really want to get aggressive, we do multiple wells and we go 24/7. But ultimately, um, we look at drilling for several months and then assaying um, and then going to that resource report that I described on the oil and gas. To accurately, um, we'll first have to do the seismic, determine which of those drill targets uh, we want to undertake, and and how deep we want to go. Currently, based on our research, we're looking at somewhere between 1,500 and 2,500 meters in depth. So again, I would I would plan that if if we're proving the oil and gas, we would have to plan for at least 12 months to get that drilled and analyzed. And uh, Alan Ramsey wants you to clarify, he says your burn is around 80,000. Is that correct? And can you talk about the infrastructure of your projects? And are you investing mm -hmm. that part of your burn? Well, our burn, um, yeah, it is about 80,000 when we're not drilling. Uh, of course, when we're drilling it, go, it's significantly higher. Um, and the infrastructure of the projects. So on the mineral side, the access to the mine sites, the building a mine, the one below the Pumsarung North, that mine is already built. And because it's 300 meters to the south, they are now undertaking the processing facility so that they can mill it. So there was a, um, I think they're building 200 tons per day. And 
and we would ultimately, if there was a, um, a proven resource that close to it, we would mine it because it's on a different license, but we would probably truck it and make a, a, a partnership on actually processing it. So that infrastructure is already in place and would accelerate it. We could truck from the wild boar prospect right down to, to that processing facility as well. And, and that would save us. On a mine that size, it would probably save us $5 million of infrastructure for the milling and the processing equipment. So there's some advantages, and I guess we would look at it when the drilling assays came back and the technical report was complete to say, this is the estimated resource we have on hand. Perfect. And we have um, Moses Salazar says, when you say there are surrounding developments of mines in the area, are any currently producing? And if so, what are they producing? And do you know at what rate? Yes. So on the gold side, um, in country, uh, Akvau mine is about 150 kilometers southwest of, of where our prospects are. It is an Australian company. Renaissance has been producing a couple of years. Um, they have, there's a, an open pit mine and they've done, a, they've done over five tons of gold um, produced in the last couple of, in the last two years. So it's, um, it's, a, it's an operation that's low grade, but lots of gold there. And I think they had a 1.2 million proven, proven ounces. And can you also talk about how you're funding the burn? Are there convertible instruments and how is it structured? Okay, our, so our burn rate currently, uh, I mean, it's, it's at a, our, our reserves on hand are very low right now because I think we're going to have one or several of these deals across the line very quickly. And they have an up, upfront cash requirement on each of them. Um, otherwise we have, uh, used on the gas capture, we used a special purpose vehicle and, and funders funded that separately so that they get a cut of the residual as well. And then we didn't have to dilute on that project. Um, going forward, we may, t we may undertake a, another private placement and a small raise um, if it's going to take longer than we plan for to close some of the oil and gas and some of the gas partnership or some of the gold partnerships. And Brayden says, great to hear you have recurring revenue beginning now. So can you elaborate as to the amount and growth regarding this? Sure. Um, with this particular pipeline series that brings these pods of production together, um, we will probably have to go beyond that to move it from half a million cubic feet up to one and a half million cubic feet. But there are a series of of, uh, you know, there's several hundred wells within a uh, 15 kilometer area. So we would, we would add to it based on bringing some of those in that are venting or that are flaring in the atmosphere to say, look, we've got a solution for you. Let's build a pipeline and tie you into this facility. The facility can handle up to 10 million cubic feet per day. So we've got lots of capacity there. We would have to put in a second compressor station, but the D high unit, we could take it. So how much, how much revenue is it going to bring? How much is the price of gas going to be? So a year ago it was nine over $9 and now it's over $2. So it's completely dependent on, on the price of gas that we're getting um, for us as a, as a corporate entity, our share, um, would bring us anywhere from, I mean, it's a big range, but if we're talking a, a $2 uh, gas, it's going to be anywhere from 10 to 20,000 a month. If we're talking $9, then you can do the math for yourself. So it really varies on that. Now that's, that's based on, on half a million cubic feet per day. Okay. Thank you for that answer, Delane. Last question. Uh, Lynn wants you to talk about your team and what production experience they have. Okay. So um, M Mike is our leading technical team operations on the ground. Um, he's been involved, like I said, in 
Libya, Germany, Canada, Cambodia for, for decades on the production side and then with the minerals for the last 15 years. Um, so again, he brings uh, technical expertise with him. Uh, he, ha he has a team under him, only a few of which were mentioned in the management. And these are, I mean, most of us are like we're, we're veterans. We're in our 50s and 60s and, and we've been doing this for, for decades. So that's the team he actually draws on. And uh, ultimately, Dennis Olette, kind of same, same range. His experience has been across, uh, um, he's been in Central America, he's been in Northern Canada, um, and then in Asia for the last decade or so. So the, the area, we know what we don't know, I guess is the bottom line. We know what we don't know, and so we go find the people that do know, and, and they fill each gap as we might. In other words, if Mike's strength is in production, but we're looking at some exploration, then we go to experts that in the exploratory drilling and bring them on board. So that's how we manage it. Perfect. Well, Delane, it's been a joy speaking with you. Great presentation. We would love to have you on in the future with some updates. Okay. Well, it's been a real pleasure for me, and I look forward to anybody has any other questions. You can see, just reach out to me. Don't hesitate. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you to all our viewers. We will be back at 1255 with BSS Inc. We'll see you soon.